Okay. Although today's message does not contain difficult Hebrew grammar, um, and it's going to be a lesson that at first blush, some of you listening may say, should this be part of the series on holy, holiness, sanctification? I think when we're done, we'll be able to give the appropriate answer, which is yes, but I'm asking you to see a dimension of something today that will allow you and I, when we go in, to start reading other areas, not the passage I'm going to be working with, to look and see where we might find the concepts that clearly depict the essence of what I've been saying for the last nine messages. So let's hope we, we can make this happen. There is, there is a passage out of Psalm, Psalms, and I, I don't want you to turn there. I just want to quote it to you because we're going somewhere else, but I want to put this in our minds. The scripture says they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. And that is basically in the summary of the children of Israel's wandering in the wilderness when it says that they tempted him, they tempted God, and limited the Holy One of Israel. If you recall in, I believe, last week's message, I referenced that, that Holy One of Israel, that specifically the prophet Isaiah, there are other places like in the Psalter where that occurs. And it's interesting that you're not going to be reading multiple references to the Holy One of Jacob. You're going to be reading about the Holy One of Israel. Israel, we know, was first Jacob's changed name. He got his name changed from Jacob to Israel, from heel catcher and conniver to the one who wrestled with the Lord and became God-governed. And although I've said to you in in the past, uh, my late husband gave that definition, it's a little bit more complex than that when you start digging lexically. You see that there's a complexity in the word, but I'm going to use the term you're familiar with, that he wrestled with the Lord and in this case became God, God governed Israel. That being said, it's interesting that it is the Holy One of Israel, not the Holy One of Jacob. And why that should matter to us is that in spite of these people doing what they did, tempting God repeatedly and limiting, limiting Him. And that's kind of a strange, if you think about it, how could we humans limit God? But the answer is pretty clear. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Therefore, you do indeed put limits on without faith. There can never be the ability to grab hold of God's word because just the act of that requires faith. So my focus today is not necessarily going to be on what I quoted, but the essence of what I quoted out of, and if you're looking for the quote, please don't turn there, Psalm 78, and that is verse 41, because I will be taking you today to First Chronicles, starting in the 13th chapter. And I'd like you to turn there, please, because I'm not hearing any pages going. I'm thinking, <laughs> wow, you're all mind readers. You're there already. Wow. Okay, so let me give a little bit of background here. There is no question that David definitely loved the Lord and delighted in his word. But after the terror of Saul's reign that almost completely left God's word and God's way out of the mix, it was put in David's heart that he should bring back, restore, and reestablish the worship that had been instituted by God through Moses in the wilderness. It was put in his heart to go and see about bringing the ark of God back and putting it in a place where it would be conspicuous, it would be seen, it would be prominent. In other words, it was in David's heart to restore worship to the people of God. And so David sets out to find the Ark of the Covenant. When we read, we heard of it in Ephrata, and we found it in the fields of the woods. David's desire to bring the Ark of the Covenant back and place it 
and we'll, we'll, we will see it kind of in this passage close to the palace, and perhaps even um, I'm of the belief that it is of the same place where Abraham offered up Isaac, which is why I always refer to Genesis, Genesis 22. There is, at the end of that passage where it says, in, in the mount of God it shall be seen. That was one of my translations. Why? Because I believe in the mount of God it shall be seen had future implications of all the activities that would occur at that location and that will occur in the future, yet unfulfilled, not happened yet at that location. And this is why when everybody talks about why Israel, why why that space? Well, all you got to do is figure out if you know your geography, the Dome of the Rock and that particular era, er, area uh, as related to prophecy, you know that it is going to be the place where every eyeball will be looking when Christ returns. So when people say, what's the big deal? Well, unless you're in the Bible and you're reading the, the prophecies. And, you know, the one thing I'd like to say as a, as a footnote, especially for some of the newer listeners, some folks who are not, they haven't gotten to prophecy yet, they start reading the Bible, and even there it's hard for some people to imagine that you're actually reading history because it couldn't be that all of this is history. But let me just tell you, this, this last year, some of the most incredible pieces were unearthed at Shiloh. And there is a, there's a dig that's been going on there for a long time. I think I told you in 2018 they found that scarab that was definitely identified. We have all kinds of interesting finds that are directly, they are directly tied in. They're not ambiguous references or ambiguous finds. They're directly related to things that people at some point said, this has to be fictitious. This couldn't possibly be, and we couldn't be dealing with real people in real places. They just recently uncovered at Shiloh three of the four horns, and it, we're going to assume, we're going to take the scholars right now and say they're assuming that these horns belong to the horns of the altar. Three out of the four have been found. They have been tested, looked at. The work that's being done at that dig, I'm telling you, they are far from being done, and the stuff that they are unearthing is in this book. So when people say, oh, it can't be, I, I don't, I'm not looking to the tangible to prove God's word. I take God at his word and all these other things. It's like, that's great. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. But it, it didn't make me come to the faith. It just now is kind of like one of those things that I'm able to share with people and say, when we get into those subjects, especially archaeology and the things that are found, it becomes very difficult to begin disputing with places. For example, they said for years that Solomon's porch and the the baths and the portico, that was just a magnificent invention. When they unearthed it, somebody said, it's real. So what I'm saying to you is when people talk about prophecy, those who are not familiar uh, or haven't kind of got their mind wrapped around the book yet, prophecy is like, well, that can't be because, you know, that's, that's so far in the future. But the reality is that this book tells us about how we began our journey as humanity that God created, Adam and Eve, and tells us what the end will be as well. There's no, um, don't let anybody tell you on this particular day, at this particular time, in this particular year, this event will mark the end of days because it says clearly no one knows the exact but time, but we can know by the season. That is translated for me as saying there are things in here that must be fulfilled and come to pass before the end. And if you're familiar with those signs, and some of them have happened, I'm going to say in my lifetime as a Christian, and I haven't been a Christian my whole life. So for those people who say, I don't know about prophecy, well, we'll, we'll get there eventually. Right now we're dealing with the reality of something that happened in the past. So let's go there. We're in First Chronicles 13. And we're looking at David's desire to bring back the ark and restore worship practice. So 
it's kind of interesting. It says, David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, if it seem good unto you, and that if it, be of, if it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel, and them also with the priests and Levites which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves together, gather themselves unto us. And let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not of it in the days of Saul. Now, here's what's interesting. I'm going to jump up to verse 5. So David gathered all Israel together from Shehor of Egypt, even unto the entering of Hemeth, to bring the ark of God from Kirjath Jerim. Somebody reading this without the full sense this part, what we're dealing with, has to do with David's failure. That sounds like a good thing. Sounds like a wonderful thing. I want to bring the Ark of the Covenant of God back to God's people. And instead of me doing it, I'm going to make the nation do it. The nation will get the credit. We'll all be happy and sing Kumbaya. But there's one big problem. The way you do things with God is more important than getting the job done. And if we look at this, what's going to happen, the first thing I want you to note somewhere, listen to what it says. I'm going to read this again. David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. That's number one. Then he spoke to all the congregation of Israel. Then he gathered all the people from Shehor of Egypt all the way to Hemath and so forth. What's missing? What? God. What? He didn't consult God. Now, you know, this may be so axiomatic, so self-evident, but I'm telling you something. If you read this properly and in the right frame of reference, you realize that this is not only something revelatory about God and the way he sees things. See, God doesn't just say, oh, that's great. These, these people are gathered here and they're worshiping. Now, I can smile when I say this, and some of you are just going to think I am just a bad person, but that's okay, because a lot of people think I'm a bad person. So join the club. Join their club. <laughs> if you think that you can, you can decide how you're going to worship God, you're a crazy person. See, God spells it out. And this is why I just stand back. I... I do my own thing. I don't want to be associated with other folks that are, say, in larger institutions and they want to, they want to partner with you. I, I, I want no part of any partnership. My partnership is with the Lord. And when I say that, it sounds a little, you know, yeah, that's, that, but here's the reason why. I've said this to you before. I'm really concerned. Let me speak about here. I'm concerned about how we do things, in fact, I think I shared with the band last night, and I didn't say it like this, but it, it's the essence of what I was trying to say. How you do for God is more important than just getting the job done. People gather in churches and they have worship and their form of worship, which for the, the unlearned in this book may be really great. And for the longest time, I used to say, why is it that this group of people over here with great popularity and people go by the droves? And, but the reality is this. Those things prosper because there is no God in it. Those things prosper and grow because the reality is, is if all of those people gathered in the way they want to worship because it's their preference and it's their way and it's their choice... Think of it. Do you think God, do you think God just says, hey, do whatever you think is right in your own eyes, and as long as you, you're calling on my name once or twice, it'll be acceptable to me. Do you think that's the God you serve? No. Neither do I. So he did not consult with God. It's a good thing done a wrong way. Or you've heard me say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And good intentions or well-meaning 
where somebody said, I had to do this thing. The, the, the Lord spoke to my heart and I had to do it. Done a wrong way is an evil thing. This day and age, our culture seems to think we must, we must evolve or change or grow into what the masses will approve and accept. Well, the masses approve David coming to them and asking of them, hey, you guys think this is a good idea? It says he consulted with the captains. Hey, you guys think this is a good idea? I want to bring the ark back. You in? Oh, yeah. Hey, congregation, you in on this? I want to bring the ark back. You, want it? you in on in this? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Would have been much better if you would have started out by saying, Lord, it's in my heart, and you know my heart, to bring the ark back so that your presence, the, the symbolic concept, but the reality of your presence will be in the midst of us. And I'm sure that the Lord would have probably spoken directly to him and said, probably I'm well pleased with David, I'm well pleased with you. But the fact that he didn't. And then now let's get back to the story. Verse 6 says, David went up in all of Israel to Bela, that is to Kirjath Jerem, which belonged to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God, of the Lord, that dwelleth between the cherubims, whose name is called on it. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ohio drave the cart. David and all of Israel played before God with all their might. Now there is added by the translators, but it is for emphasis, and I'll I will just read it that way. I, this is something really wonderful. They go and they retrieve the ark. Think of it. They have oxen there to carry the cart. That's a practical thing, right? That's quite pragmatic. That makes sense. You wouldn't have a camel carrying the cart, would you? Right. Put the ox and get the cart. It's a new cart. And then there's going to be this great procession, celebration. Who doesn't love celebration? We're singing praises. And it says they played with all their might. Doesn't that sound awesome? Shouldn't it be that way? That pe the people sing with everything that's in their heart. They're, they're worshiping, right? Mm, hold on. They were singing with harps, psalteries, with timbrels, with cymbals, with trumpets. And when they came upon the threshing floor of Chidon, your Bible says called Nashon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark when the oxen stumbled. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him. He killed him. He struck him down because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Now, I want you to kind of pause with me for a second. David was displeased with the Lord because the Lord basically killed Uzzah for his act of trying to reach out and touch the ark. Now, on the surface, anyone who hears this for the first time will say, well, God is cruel. Uzzah was just trying to keep the thing from falling. And if you know your Bible, Abinadab is Uzzah's father. And they do come from a line of Levites out of the tribe of Levi, but they were not, here we go, they were not the ones chosen to carry the cart. That would have been assigned to the family and the lineage of Kohath. And the Kohathites, that was their responsibility. And this tells you a little bit about the mindset. Let's make it convenient for us. It also tells you something else, because there's something really kind of wacky about this. If you, if you kind of read this, and carefully, you'll find out that in this whole thing, the priests are not in the right place. There are priests present. They're not in the right place. That Uzzah is from that lineage, but he's not called to do that task. With God, there were specific people. The Kohathites would insert the poles through the rings, and that's how the ark would be carried. It was not to be put on the back of any beast. God said, this is the way you transport it. This is the way it's to be handled. This is who touches it. This is how. 
That's why I said with God, it's more important. When you're listening to God, he's saying, this is how I want it done. This is a clear example of what not to do. Well, just get the job done. Doesn't matter, right? Now, you might say, is this only a lesson out of a series? No, this is a lesson for every single person listening to me. I start with me, and it goes all the way to whoever can hear me. That you can't come into the church and bring the world's ideas and the world's concepts and say, and let's apply it. It doesn't work. It has to be done God's way, in God's time, by God's design. And I've said before, I'm looking for people to understand what I preach is the Bible, and what I ask of people is be authentic. Don't try and copy somebody. Don't try and act like somebody else. Don't try and impersonate somebody. We'll leave that one alone. Because I don't think much to say about that one. Okay. They didn't lack enthusiasm. They were singing. And with all their might. Right? They didn't lack enthusiasm. Now, anybody looking at this thing would say, but God is pretty cruel. He, he kills this guy for trying to, to stabilize the ark. Oh, God's pretty hard to please. I wouldn't want to serve somebody that's that hard to please. You know, the reality is God's not hard to please. When God says, this is this, it means this is this. And you either are in love with this is this, or you say, yes, this is this. And you may not love it, but that's what God said, and that's the way he wants it done. Period. Not discussable. Keep reading with me. So it says here, David was displeased because of the Lord. He made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore, the place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. That is the breach of Uzzah. And let's now go to the next thing here. So David was displeased. The next thing we read of is David was afraid of God that day, saying, how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So there was a lesson learned out of this. When David saw Uzzah struck down and the whole thing had been essentially halted by God's act and intervention, it struck a chord with David. Well, how am I going to bring it? How am I going to transport this thing now? It says, so David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. (laughs) So, the moral of the story, (laughs) never mind. So, we might say a few things here, and this is what I want to talk about. As I said, there was very little thought to include God and make him first. I think I just said that about giving, but it applies to everything. You inquire and... And when I say inquire, I'm saying you talk to God about something first. You're you're not going to go wrong by starting off first there and moving in another direction. Uh, But there is, again, there's so many lessons in here. I'm trying to stay on course, but I can tell you, for example, when the whole multitude gathers in and says, yeah, that's a good idea, go the other way. Usually that herd mentality, and it's like that. It just builds momentum, and then you kind of feel embarrassed if you're going the other way. Well, not for me. I'd rather go the other way because I know that most of the time the mass uh, multitudes are going to usually choose the easiest way, and usually it's the wrong way as well. I choose salmon. Sorry. (laughs) Never mind. Uh, You never know where things come from. Why am I emphasizing about this cart as well. God never said, put it on the back of a beast. He said, that's the work of man, not of beast. That's in our nature, to make our life easier, even when it comes to the things of God. And this is why this lesson out of, out of these pages is timeless, because there is a, a mindset from just this chapter alone that kind of permeates Christendom today. And that is, it doesn't matter. We have our own interpretation of it. It doesn't matter. Now, listen, when you start looking at denominations and you realize, and a lot of people don't know this, so I'm saying this for the benefit of those who don't, when you talk about Protestants, 
the people were called Protestants because they protested. What were they protesting? They were protesting against the corruption of the Catholic Church. This is in Martin Luther's day, and as many of you know, that happens to be my favorite time in history because there, there was a lot of things that went on in that particular time. But Protestant does, is not simply you're born into it. You should know that the reason why we are called Protestants is we protested against, and more specifically, the protest was against the abuse of the things of God in what was the largest inst- religious institution of its day. And that doesn't say that suddenly we, we protested and therefore there's never going to be any corruption or anything to protest among the Protestants, because there is. Because it's the nature of people, of humans, to corrupt everything. That's in our DNA. That's what we do. So even if somebody starts off with good intentions and good motives and they're a good moral person, usually give it enough time and it'll just be... It's, it's even within... Protestantism, it becomes feeding the machine. I told you the story about a certain ministry, and I was distantly acquainted with the person of the ministry who was the, the, the I, I don't even want to call it pastor because they didn't have a congregation. I don't even know what to call them, but they were the individual that was the face of the ministry. And I think that they started off good, desiring to help people and spread the word of God and tell people there's hope. Hang on, there's hope. When your life falls apart, you got something to hang on to. You're not alone. Somebody's with you. And I think that changed over time to where it became feed the machine because that ministry grew and it kept growing. Suddenly it became about needing more money to feed the machine, need more money, which requires more aggressive fundraising, which requires people to come in And those people that started coming in to be the quote-unquote fundraisers actually became the people that brought in that damnable heresy that became the trend in the 80s and the 90s of if you give, you'll get. God will fill your bank account, your pocket, everything else he'll fill. But, you know, the only thing they left out is maybe you want to ask God to fill you with him first. I'm not quite sure that they got that memo. So it's, it's pretty plain here. You, you could make this application, th- just this first Chronicles 13, and you could say, this is what the church is today without care, but it's, it has the semblance of going through the motions. It's got the outward show, but there's nothing on the inside that says reserved for God. Think about that. One last point before I leave here, because I'm going to go to another chapter to round out the message is I want you to look at the key word in verse 12. David was afraid. He was afraid of God that day. Now, there's different types of fear in the Bible, right? You can have the word fear meaning awe and reverence, but this, the way this is intended to mean is exactly the type of thing we're talking about. He was afraid because of what he saw that God had struck down Uzzah. I'll come back to Uzzah, maybe. He's important, but the bigger picture may be of greater importance here. David was afraid of God. God is not the author of fear. Then when people say, I'm I'm afraid, I'm scared, we're not talking about doubt or worry. We're talking about that, you know, the the knee shaking, quivering, oh, what's going to happen now type thing. God's not the author of fear. If somebody says, I trust that God's going to take care, I can tell you one thing. Every time I've seen things fall apart and people who claim to have a relationship with God say they are afraid, the first thing that tells me is another voice has been talking to them because God's not the author of fear. And the devil, he brings confusion. He's the master at that. Confuse enough people and they'll just go at each other. Right? Right? In fact, I'm going to say this as another sidebar. I think sometimes we're so not in tune spiritually with the spiritual attacks that come upon people. Much like, I'm going to say it, it's the dreaded thing I'm going to say, much like what's happening with our country. We no longer walk around saying, I'm a proud American. You know, I'm a proud American. And I'm, I'm very proud to say I'm American. I'm going to see how many times in 30 seconds I can say I'm a proud, proud American. I'm so proud to live in this great country called America because, 
It is the greatest place to live on earth. It is the best place to live on earth. We have the greatest army. We've got the greatest everything, except for the people that say it's not great. <laughs> right. The greatest, the greatest freedom. You know, I want to tell you something. You're going to hear it from me. You know what? Some people are going to be angry, but I'm just going to tell you. I bet some of you share the same sentiment. I'd like to take all the people that don't like this country, that don't like living here, that don't like anything. They've become anti-American, and I'd like to take them and give them a one-way ticket to Qatar. Or Qatar. Okay? <laughs> it's called the 24-hour experiment. <laughs> you get off the plane, and you say... What the hell? <laughs> Get me out of here. No, you didn't like America. I, f I wish I could make that come true. Just come on. Here's the, the plane going to your dream country. And may Sharia law be with you. <laughs> Listen, I respect the differences going on. But I'm, I, I started this by saying we have become so confused and I'm going to say this to you. Spirit, there is a spiritual problem in America, but you can't tell a lot of Americans that because a lot of Americans say, I'm not spiritual. I'm not even religious. But I want you to see how we went from a country and people that were proud, that were saying, this is the best place, to a divisive bunch of, really it is, it's like children, just petty children. Like this is all you do all day, like this. And it comes to color, race, gender. We bring up every subject that we can to bring division. Now, I'm not saying we're ever going to be syncretistically holding hands and walking down the street singing Kumbaya, but holy Toledo, when you look at it, you realize that there is something at work here. And it is the same principle. As I said, leave God out of the equation. Don't involve God and you'll have plenty of confusion. Don't involve any spirituality of, and I'm going to say it like this, of any higher power. We just are in charge of ourselves. We do what's right in our own eyes. We don't answer to anybody, you think. Okay, so the ark stays at Obed-Edom, the Gittite's house, for the space of three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom. Now read with me First Chronicles 15, because this is the bookends of doing something your way for God versus doing it God's way for God. And David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. Here is the right mindset now. The motivation and the intent from chapter 13, now with the right fixate, fixated view, which is prepared a place for the ark, pitched a tent for it. Now there's thought of God is first, prepare, get ready, prepare the place. In other words, this is what he should have done in the first place. Then David said, none ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. So here is the wonder of it all. When you do it God's way, these were the people. Now, it says Levites, I don't want to get particular, but there were a group of people chosen to do a specific task. Each had their own responsibilities. David knew that. Now we're going to do it the right way. David gathered all of Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place, which he had prepared for it. And David assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites, the sons of Kohath, Uriel, the chief, his brethren, and 120, the sons of... And you've got all the people listing all the folks that are here. And I could keep reading, but it says... I'm going to jump to 1525, because that's where I want to focus on. So David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obed-Edom with joy. They didn't go there afraid. They didn't go there confused. They didn't go there thinking, what if? They went there. They went to get it out of the house of Obed-Edom with joy. And when it came to pass, when God helped the Levites that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, that they offered seven bullocks and seven rams. That's the other thing that was missing. 
And you can say, I don't think so, but I'm going to tell you absolutely. There should have been sacrifices offered. That's God's way. What was missing the first time, there were no sacrifices, and there were certainly no blood sacrifices. And the key thing, if you go back and you read Leviticus, that would be a very key part of worship, of approaching God. Not only that, there would have been the initial sacrifices offered to the Lord, and then there would have also been blood that should have been applied to the ark, the procedure that would have happened after the death of Uzzah. There are two things that should have happened sacrificially that did not. So now David's making it right. He says here, So David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the house of the Lord, of the house of Obed-Edom with joy. And it came to pass when God helped the Levites. He helped them that bear the ark of the Lord, or the covenant of the Lord, that they offered seven bullocks and seven rams. And David was clothed with a robe of fine linen. And all the Levites that bear the ark and the singers and Shenaniah, the master of the song with the singers, David also had upon him the ephod of linen. Thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord, or the ark of the Lord, or the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, with shouting and with sound of the coronet, trumpets, cymbals, making noise with psalteries and harps. And it came to pass as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, that Michal, the daughter of Saul, looking out a window, saw David, King David, dancing and playing. And that an, begins another story. She despised him in her heart. That begins something else, which is not my message. So I want you to kind of take note of this. First and foremost, there is a frame of reference or frame of mind regarding the things of God. Chapter 13 says David did not have the right frame of mind. He wasn't considering God. He wasn't considering the steps that should have been taken. And let's, let's talk about, so well, let's call it this. It was a failure. The attempt to do something for God the first time was a failure. I'm going to say like this to you who are listening to me. A lot of times we want to do things for God and we fail. That failure should produce a stepping back and and a reassessment. Did I start in the right place? Did I start putting God first? Did I start about the word of God, the will of God, the way of God? Or was I thinking, this will be cool. I'm going to get this done and then I'm going to say, look, God, look what I did for you big daddy, right? As you have people like that, their mindset is just that. They don't care about how, they just want to get it done. And God says, I don't accept that. Not only do I not accept it, it's worship that I do not consider worship. That's the other revelation, is that when I talk about Christendom today, there's a lot of worship today that's not worship unto the Lord. You can say whatever you want, but I've seen a lot of these worship sessions, and what they are, it is a lot of the the individuals, especially those who are playing music, they are venerated as rock stars. They they look like it too. The The whole feel of it, the whole design is that the individual that's on the platform or the stage is is the the one. And then you've got all the flunkies or all the I want to call them automatons because they're just going with it and it's saying, oh, this is, this is great. And ask them what's so great about it. Well, I had a great time. Well, that's great that you had a great time, but what did you learn in your great time about God? If you aren't learning about God, God's way and God's word when you come to church, you're not going to church, period. <laughs> it's, 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 just, it's, it's, it's really not that complicated. But what I, I want to look at right here is the, 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 the last verse I referenced here, that they got the, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obed-Edom with joy. Because that's probably something, and I addressed this last night when I had a talk with some of the folks here, but that's something that should be present when you do something for God and you're, you're, you're following when God says, I want you to do this, this, and that, and you're doing it, it should be with joy. It shouldn't be that I, I, I show up, but I'm kind of pissed that I have to show up. I show up, but I really don't want to be here. I show up. No, it should be with great joy. And if you think about 
there, again, there's so many messages in this passage, it's hard to stay on track. But a lot of times, we want what we want, and we want it our way. We're not considering that God says, I got a plan. It starts in that book. If you just kind of follow the plan, I'm not asking you to be a legalist, a perfectionist, a I'm going to do this uh, legalistic way, but rather... I've given you the outline, and especially when you move into the New Testament. This is the most mind-boggling thing, because in the New Testament, we're told just one thing. Over and over again, in a diverse, diverse conversations with different people, what must I do to be saved? The question is asked from different mouths, but all referring to the same person, and they all say the same thing. The King James says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I've told you the word for belief is You've got to go to the Greek, all of those derivatives that bring you to a place we'd be better off saying, amen. That is, you know that you know that you know. It is the absoluteness. It's the solid rock, Jesus Christ. That's where you start. And so when we talk about this, the, the element that was missing at the beginning, oh, they all gathered. They were singing with all their might but there was no joy. You remember that passage that I taught out of of Nehemiah about the joy of the Lord? In other places, David himself, out of Psalm 51, talks about restore restore the joy that I once had or once knew. Once joy goes out of your spirituality and your worship, it may be that the thing that is flat is you, not God. God hasn't changed. It says our God is a jealous God, a consuming fire, He's desiring for us to look unto him. He's desiring that we look to his word. And I know this is the toughest thing for some folks that say, well, this book is archaic. It's not applicable. Hey, I just, I just taught a lesson out of a chapter of David's life, which takes us back before the kingdoms divided. We at least know a, a timeline of approximately in what window between, say, somewhere between 1,000 and 930, because that's when the kingdom split. So even that long ago, God was saying, this is the way I want things done. And we're not talking, we're not even looking at some form of a law that says do and don't. We're looking at what God spoke to his servant and said, this is the way, walk ye in it. So I think the message is not archaic. The message speaks to even to worship practices today if you're not putting God first, and that's not enough to just, you know, I have a sermon here, and every, maybe twice in uh, my 10-minute sermon, I say Jesus and amen. And you know, oh, that's pretty spiritual. Pastor did a good job today. She said Jesus and amen. I learned something today. Pastor knows how to say Jesus and amen. <laughs> but the proper thing is I'm showing you something with God. The way you do something for him is more important than just getting the job done. So what does this have to do with holiness and uh, holy and sacred? It has a lot to do. See, God's word, his word of instruction is holy. God is holy and his word of instruction is. That means it is unique and exclusive to him. His, whether it is a demand, a decree, a plea, it doesn't matter. That word becomes the word. There isn't another word apart from it. And that exclusive word became the living word, Jesus Christ, for which I can say, Jesus Christ, he is holy. There is not another one. He was separated to do the Father's will. So when I look at this, I I think a couple of things. The Ark of the Covenant, as I taught a couple of weeks ago, is holy and cannot be handled commonly. Do you realize that what David did in organizing all the people and the leaders and the captains and excluding God was handling the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord in a common and profane way. Even though his heart and the intentions were good, still profane and not the way God said this is the way to do it. So the instructions of God's word, the Ark of the Covenant, the way of approach to God, all of these things could be deemed and called holy. They are set apart. They are not common. They are not homogenized. Now, not once in this passage, uh, in the two passages I read, did the word holy holiness or sanctification occur, but even within the realm, for example, of the priest, it was the priest's job, their responsibility to carry the ark. And yet commonly, maybe it was because 
Abinadab maybe said to Uzzah, son, you get out there and you, you help. Now, I think until that point, there wasn't any issue. I said to you, Uzzah indeed is from uh, a house of Levi. But the issue was when he reached out to stabilize it. And I, I need to touch on this quickly because there'll be people that say this is very unfair. He was just trying to do the right thing. Okay, he's doing the right thing the wrong way. And with God, that matters. Do you know, back there in Numbers 4, 5, it says nobody touches the ark. You know what that means? It means nobody touches the ark. (laughs) You needed a translation for that one. (laughs) Whoa! (laughs) And it was all done in English, too. So my point is, God said there's a way to, to transport the ark. Doesn't that make the transportation of the ark, the method and the means, the individual, the ark itself, all holy. So without there being a mention of it, this embodies that, which I've been trying to commute, at least one dimension. It's another dimension of what I've been trying to say, that you can easily read passages of the Bible and without those words being there, see that this is very important to God. And what is extremely important when I have a takeaway for this, we can always, there's types in everything. The the carrying up, if you will, of the ark as a type. And I I like to use type sometimes. The carrying up of the ark to the hill as a type of the ascension of Christ. There's so many different shadows and types in here that if I was just going to do a lesson on shadows and types, I'd say there's a lot in here. But everything in God's book... We say there's history, there's God's story being told, but there's also the need to look at, as I said, the bigger picture and see the themes that dwell within each of these, we'll call them vignettes. And the theme there is doing something for God, God's way. There's, there's ways, there's man's ways, and there's God's ways. But the things that, if you're going to do it God's way, the mind has to understand God has set boundaries. God has set things in order. God has set his word, given us a way, and he expects it that way. You move into the New Testament, uh, you have, we'll call it a little looser mindset that Jesus knows, for example, the spirit of the woman that he encounters at the well at, in, in the middle of the day, and We can talk about that. He doesn't judge the woman. He doesn't condemn the woman. Even there, he says, he tells the woman that in that whole conversation in John 4, that God is a spirit that must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Tell me how, if we're going to take a New Testament idea and say God is to be worshipped in spirit and truth, was there any spirit? Go back. I know it's Old Testament. Go back to the first Chronicles 13. Was there any spirit in moving the ark the way David was planning to do it? No. So this is why I said to you, it's important to kind of look at the concepts, put them together, but then don't just look at this and say, oh, that's that's a great story to make an application to. Let's make the application to us. And this is perhaps why I have little or no patience when people see the church as anything else but you're going to run amok. You're going to, you are going to be a train wreck. If you see the church as anything else, it belongs to the Lord. This is not my church. This is not your church. This is his church. If you keep that clear, and if I keep that clear, of times I've said, I've used the personal pronoun my to make a point, but I've never said to you, me, my. This is the Lord's. It belongs to the Lord. We're all just stewards here. You think anything else, you're foolish. So in the in the realm of stewardship, it's important for us to look at God's word with stewardship and take the lessons, make the applications to ourselves today. With God, it is more important that we look at how he desires the way of approach, if you will, because he lays it out. He lays out the way of approach from the beginning, from the moment. In fact, I'd go so far as to say the way of approach was laid out to God before the sin in the garden even occurred. The way of approach had to be laid out. God said, this is the way you come to me. We know that there had to be a place, for example, where Cain and Abel offered a specific offering at a set time. Although it's not there, 
we can know from other uh, pieces of information. We can glean enough to know that God had a set time and a set place before he instituted sacrifices, the Passover, or anything else that was in God's heart already. So with God, the way we do things is more important than just getting the job done. With God, with ministry, with your personal, your personal relationship with God, God first, everything else comes afterwards. Now, some people take that and they, they, they hear that God first, everything afterwards, and they think, well, there's not going to be anything left for me. That mindset is the mindset that is miserly, that doesn't have the capacity to give of oneself or to say, it's about someone that's not me, but about him, bigger than me, greater than me, who brought me into the realm of understanding. This lesson says, I can do for God, but it's going to be God's way or the job won't get done, which is why I've been really kind of grinding on you as a, as a congregation and telling you over and over again, I'm not looking to consult you like David did in consulting the leaders and we'll call it the, the uh, civic element, you know. Let's consult all the people first and let's, let's, let's take a, a committee reading here and see if we all are in agreement. There's only one place to agree. If two can be in agreement, they can walk together before the Lord. That's a little twist on Amos's verse. But what I'm saying to you is it's important for us to be like-minded. And when I say like-minded, it's having the mind of Christ to put the things of God first and to make sure that the things of God are in the things of God and not bringing the things of man and the ideas of what's out in the world and saying, now let's, let's apply this in the church. That's why somebody once was telling me, you know, I, I shared with you, they have a church where they don't, they don't do any structured giving. They put all the bills. I've told you this before. They put all the bills on a post-it board and the people come by and they decide what bill they're going to pay I'm sorry, that's not the way God set that up. And I could see possibly that they don't want to have any structured giving. Do you know why? Because that would actually take and require somebody to teach people, not about money, but about God. And if you're not willing to do that, don't call yourself a church. Giving is intrinsic to Christianity. The greatest giver of all time gave his life. That's much more than a dime in your pocket gave his life that you might live and have life eternal, that I might have life eternal, that my sins may be forgiven and that I may be and am reconciled back to God and will spend eternity with him. If you're not willing to do it God's way, don't bother, friends. And you may, you may say, wasn't well, there something in the middle? No, there isn't. Go to the book of Revelation. It says the folks there at a particular church were neither hot nor cold. He called them lukewarm. And he says, you know what I do with those people? I spew them out of my mouth. Now, I can't make you be on fire for the Lord. I can't make you be whatever. But I can give you the instructions and say it's, it's, it's now for you to meditate, think on. Sometimes it's really good for all of us. Even if we are walking in the word and we're fading, it's good for us to sometimes, as I've said, take a spiritual accounting. Of, that's you for you. You don't share it with somebody. You don't go ask a brother or a sister. You don't have to go talk to somebody. You sit down. It's you and God. Do a spiritual accounting. How much of my time do I spend with him or thinking about him versus the rest of the time? And when I do whatever it is that I'm doing, am I doing it because in all things, as Colossians says, in all things that Christ may have preeminence, or am I doing it like a show or going through the motions? I said to the people here last night, if we can't have the real thing, and this is not verbatim, but if we can't have the real thing, I don't want anything. I want, I want us to be authentic. I don't want to be the place where people come and they're confused because in the moment they felt spiritual while their hands were swinging. And in the moment they felt spiritual while somebody was knocking them on the forehead and pushing them down. They felt spiritual. It was, a, it was a spiritual happening. But let me just tell you something. That's, to me, by and large, that's just show for the multitudes. I'm not saying that it may, not, it may be real in some places, but for the most part, especially when it's going up on TV and people are showing this on TV what it's done, the design, is to show you that that individual supposedly has power over the people. The only person who has power over the people is Jesus Christ. The only person who matters is the blood that was shed for you and for me. That's the focus. And when the focus is there, tell you what, anything you're going to set out to do for God, anything at all, 
will be done with the spirit that puts him first, and God will honor that. Just like the house of Obed-Edom, I'm sure they opened the doors when nobody else, after the death of Uzzah, and they saw that man laying on the, on the ground, who wants to take the ark in? <laughs> you? But he was brought into the house of Obed-Edom. What does it say? The Lord blessed that house. I don't think he blessed the house just for Obed-Edom's sake. I think he blessed the house because they opened the doors. Now, let's bring it to uh, an application. They opened the doors and basically let God in. Now, I'm not one of those people that says God is knocking, like those that interpret Revelation say, God's knocking, let him in. Sorry, God knocked a long time ago. You weren't even on the earth when he knocked, okay? It's called creation. So if your mindset, though, is, is tapping into this a little bit, yes, the house of Obed-Edom, they opened up their house to the presence of God, and God blessed them. They Probably no one else did. They did, and God blessed them for that. I'm wondering if there is any individuals here as a tabernacle of God who are like the house of Obed-Edom, ready to say, I'm ready to do it God's way and watch what the Lord will do for you. And I'm not saying that the Lord's going to, he's not some bestower of bling, and, you know, he's the dispenser of all things, but in him, all things are. Therefore, if he is in our midst, we have all things and everything that we could possibly need. So, although holy, holiness and sanctification don't appear, the essential meaning of those words do. So I'm going to include it as number 10 in my series, Next week, we will possibly, if the Lord wills, return to more hardcore digging of this same subject. Till then, that's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch Listen and learn 24 hours a day. Simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.